Now you'll see on the program that now we're looking at uh, the last discourse as a whole. Given the fact that due to limitations of time we can't do um, detailed analysis of the last discourse, uh, we'll just look at the overall picture. But I will, I hope, give you a feel for it. In the liturgy, the passages used from the last discourse are particularly John 13 with the foot washing on Holy Thursday and then John 17, the final prayer. Uh, the pieces in between don't get much of an appearance unless you are a, uh, a priest or a religious and you say Mass every day and it turns up for you every morning and each time you read it you say, I think I talked about that yesterday. <laughs> And that is a very real experience because it's very repetitive. Yes. It says a lot of things over and over and over again. Now, everybody says, oh, it's beautiful, the last discourse, beautiful. But well, it's not all that difficult, not all that simple. And this has created problems for scholars over the years, all this repetition. And so they've come up with a, a widely recognized theory that all of this repetition comes from the use of sources and that behind the last discourse is a narrative which is the story of the foot washing and its aftermath I'm giving the numbers that I accept these are also debated it's a narrative then you get in chapter 14 a very early or the earliest version of a discourse of Jesus, a farewell discourse of Jesus that is a part of the tradition of the community uh, their memory of Jesus last evening with them, 14, 1 to 31. They then say that this early discourse became so much a part of the life of the community that they kept on using it and telling it etc and as happens when you keep telling stories, think of your own family stories, it got richer in the telling. <laughs> and what you find here in 16.4-33 is a richer version of this discourse. So that's why you get so much repetition. You've got this and it's basically just said again in richer terms. This discourse here in the middle is the one about the vine and the branches. That's different altogether. And they say that this comes from a time very close to the expulsion from the synagogue because this is where we found those words of Jesus, they will throw you out of the synagogue. So this is a late addition. And then you have a final prayer of Jesus which is typical of discourse material in ancient the ancient world. Very often great people leave the world in their literature with long discourses. The, even in the Bible. The book of Deuteronomy is Moses' last discourse. Don't know whether you ever noticed but uh, when Paul is going back he stops at Miletus and he calls all of the leaders from Ephesus and he gives them this beautiful last discourse that reduces them all to tears. Similarly in there's a, a wonderful collection of documents which we now have and he recently confirmed in their integrity uh, at Qumran called the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. Each one of the great patriarchs has his own last testament. So this tradition of having a testament is very common and many of them finish with a prayer. And so this is typical last discourse literary form created by various sources that have been put together to create the discourse as we now have it. And then the scholars say, well good, I've got that fixed. What's the next problem? Well, that's not good enough. If he put it together from these various sources, from chapter 13 all the way to the end of chapter 26, he has created five chapters, a quarter of his gospel created with this material. It means something to him. What we have to do is to get through all of this tendency there, those like Mary and myself who work in this, if you read 
a lot of the commentaries, you will get all this sort of stuff. And I say first discourse, second discourse, later discourse, etc. And, and they'll analyze it as if it was all self-standing and show the parallels, etc. I'm not happy with that at all. So let me show you what I think we need to do. And I want you to keep that in mind. Keep what I've just said to you in mind. And I'm going to, you're going to need your, you're going to need your Bibles quite intensely here. I want you to look at 13, 1 to 38. And I want you to notice key words that come at the beginning of 13. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come. To depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own, he loved them telos, to the end. And the Greek word for end is telos. Ace telos. So that's the way it opens. As it ends, turn over to the end of John 13. And look at 31, 32. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and in him God is glorified. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and he will glorify him now. Glory. But then he tells them that he's going away. And there's going to be a way in which they must live in the in-between time. And that's spelt out in verses 34 to 35 with the command to love. The new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. By this they shall know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now as I do this I want you to remember that I fully accept that this discourse is gathered together from different sources. What I'm trying to show you is that John has imposed a theological unity upon this material that is amazing. I want you now to turn over to 17, the end. Chapter 17. Now I want to notice again how it begins. After Jesus had spoken up these words, he looked up to heaven, he takes the position of prayer, and he says, Father, the hour has come. <laughs> glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you. And if you go down to verse 5, So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. Then look at verse 4. I glorified you on earth, and in our English text we have, by finishing, by bringing to a telos, by bringing to an end the work that you gave me to do. I glorified you on earth by bringing to perfection. And the word is to finish, to perfect, and again, the Greek background is telos. 
Now go down to the end of John 17. Verses 24 to 26. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory which you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved them may be in them, and I in them. Is it in the text? Yeah. Am I inventing this? No. Not at all. It's there. Now we need to see what else is going on in this discourse. In 14 and 16, you remember I said to you that pretty well universally scholars say that this is the earliest form of a discourse of Jesus remembered in the community that has then been rewritten in a more highly developed and theological way in chapter 16. They both deal with the same question and the question is departure. Jesus is going away. Departure. They are not identical. There are different elements of richness that can come into this, but the theme of departure, departure, is in both. The basic message of 14 and 16 is Jesus must go away. It is to their benefit that he go away. He will send them another paraclete who will remind them of everything that he has taught them. They will even do bigger things than he has done because of what they learned from the paraclete. The paraclete will be with them judging the evilness of the world in the time of this in-between time. And in the meantime, both of them say the same thing, there are two commandments that you must follow. You must believe, you must believe and follow the commandments of Jesus. Do what Jesus taught you and believe in me. In the in-between time, you are to believe and do and follow the commandments. So paraclete, belief, commandments. I will not leave you orphans. And here is the place where the theme of our couple of days together emerges. It is in this situation, even in the experience of the departed Jesus, that you will have great joy. Your joy will be full. Don't worry about the fact that I'm gone away. I'm giving you all sorts of gifts that will make your joy something that no one can take off you. The joy that the world cannot give. This is what you're going to find in 14 and 16. It's the teaching on how the community is to live in the in-between time because of the departure of Jesus. These are about departure and its consequences. Then in the middle, 15, I want you to notice, first of all, 1 to 11. Look at verses 1 to 11. 1 to 11 are all about the vine and unfortunately most scholars say that this section that deals with the vine goes down as far as verse 8. But in fact it's not about the vine. The vine is only an image that is used. It's about a much more important Johannine word which Mary has already mentioned a couple of times to remain, to remain. You'll notice that the vine is very strong, the image, 
But once you get to verse 4, look at the word abide or remain. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me. Look at verse 6. Whoever does not abide in me. Look at verse 7. If you abide in me. And people notice that the vine image finishes at verse 8. But look at verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. 1 to 11 is about abiding. Very important Joe and I notion. This mutuality, this oneness between Christ and the believer, which is mutual. This is one of the beautiful things about the vine image that people often don't notice. It's sort of between the lines in John 15, 1 to 11. Basically, John 15, 1 to 11 says, as it says in 15, it says, without me, you can do nothing. Okay? However, there will be no, there will be no vine if the branches aren't producing fruit. So it's a mutuality, isn't there? If, if, sorry, the other way around. There's going to be no tree if the leaves aren't doing their job. Okay? But basically it's about this mutuality between the presence of Christ among them in the, in the church, in the paraclete, that's, this is where they are to abide and experience the love of God made manifest in Jesus Christ. So they are to abide. Then from 12 through to 17, look at the inclusion. Look at verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Look over to verse 17. I'm giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. There's an inclusion between verse 12 and verse 17 that focuses on the command to love. And it is in here, of course, that Jesus says, no one has greater love than this, than to lay one down one's life for one's friends. But perhaps the most important passage in this is verse 16. Maintaining the great, or founding the great Christian tradition. You did not choose me, but I chose you. So here's the center of the discourse. A command to love to those who have been chosen by Jesus Christ himself. But this is then followed by 18 through to 16.3 and it's all about hatred. It's all about hatred. If you look at the text it's going to say they will hate you as they have hated me. And they will hate you because they will not recognize that I am the sent one of the Father. And they will not recognize that you are my sent ones. They'll hate you so much that they'll throw you out of the synagogues. And the time is coming when they will even kill you and regard themselves as offering glory to God. Now, whatever about the background, the sources, that generated this particular section of John's Gospel, one quarter of the Gospel. This section is about the hour of Jesus, this moment of Jesus lifting up into glory in which he will make the Father known because he reveals love. <coughs> If you want to know how much God loves you, the Joe and I and Jesus would say, look at the lifted up Christ. That's how much he loves you. The crucifixion is the revelation of the love of God. So, this is the hour 
when that happens but it is also the hour through which Jesus must pass to return to the Father. Two things happen. This is complicated. Those of you who have managed to buy the book Love in the Fourth Gospel will see this all spelled out for you. But there is the glorification of God on the cross, or the glory of God, the revelation of the glory of God on the cross, and the glorification of the Son by means of the cross, which we find here in 17.4. Father, glorify me with you, with the glory that I had before the world was made. Jesus' task on earth is not to make himself known, but to make the love of the Father known. By means of that, he will return to the place where he came from with the Father. Now, on the basis of that, this whole discourse is about the hour which is the revelation of love which brings to perfection the task which Jesus has been given to do. This love reveals the glory of God and takes Jesus to the glory which was his before the world was made. But notice how the whole thing has been structured. Sorry? This is the glory starts here. The theme of love begins it and ends it. The theme of love begins and ends the first chapter of it. The theme of glory begins and ends the final chapter of it. The theme of departure and how you are to live in the in-between time is spelled out in 14 and 16. Gift of the paraclete, the commandments that you've got to follow, all of that sort of stuff is the, ins the clear instructions. Do not fear. This is where you're going to have this joy that the world ca can never give you. All of this encouraging material in 16 and 18. And then in the middle, the lived experience of a community that in the face of hatred must abide in Jesus and abide in one another and abide in the love which God showers on them in and through Jesus. And in to do this, they must love one another as Jesus has loved them. And so what do you find? Love and glory begin and end and love and glory are found in the middle because the love that Jesus reveals on the cross for which this introduces is in fact the revelation of God's love and that is called glory. Bit of a quick step there, I realise. I need to, I need to go back on a lot of words here but the word glory in Greek is doxa. Doxa. The word doxa is the visible manifestation of the presence of a caring God which goes all the way back to the Exodus. It begins with the kavod Adonai, with this glory of God which is visible at the gift of Sinai. And from then on all through the biblical tradition Things that you can see and touch and eat, the manna, they're all described as the glory of God. Going through the Red Sea, glory of God. And then that language of glory of God is applied to all experienced reality. You know Psalm 19, the very skies cry out the glory of God. You want to see how beautiful God is? Look at the world around you. Doxa is a very beautiful word which means the visible, experienced revelation of the beauty and greatness of God. For John's Gospel, that moment of the revelation of God's love is the cross. Strange, isn't it? Great enigma. But the cross for John is the revelation of God's love. That is the doxa. So love and doxa become one. And by means of the cross, John, Jesus returns to where he came from and he is glorified. 
the cross reveals the glory of God. Through, by means of the cross, Jesus returns to the glory which he had before the world was made. And in the meantime, the church is left behind to reflect upon this, to follow the commands which they are given on how they are to live in the in-between time, and to abide in Jesus' love in the midst of hatred, loving one another, be not because they chose him, but because he chose them. Doubtless, this final composition is the result of decades of reflection and praying and experiencing various stories, a narrative, a prayer, a farewell discourse that's rewritten, another discourse written in the time of rejection, no doubt. But it is, appears in this way, written with consummate care to give us the hour that begins both. Love, love. Glory, glory. Love and glory crisscrossing and meeting right in the center of the discourse where the community itself is commanded to mutual love so that they in their own turn might reflect, as the prayer will say, the love that exists between the Father and the Son. Thank you very much.